Welcome to the World Economic Forum right here in Davos and welcome to Bloomberg's televised panel. I'm Francine Lacqua. Now, since 2008, central banks have added trillions of dollars to their balance sheet, driven yields to places they've never been before and suspended gravity in global markets. And now, as they start to tighten monetary policy, is the world economy really ready for the end of easy money? Well, please give a big round of applause to my wonderful panelists. Let's get straight to them. <laughs> Joining us now, Benoit Coré, he's ECB executive board member, Cecilia Skingsley, Ricks Bank deputy governor, Ray Dalio, Bridgewater Associates founder, Min Zhu, National Institute of Financial Research chairman, and Axel Weber, the chairman of UBS. So thank you for joining us. I think we need to straight start on currencies. So we'll get to inflation in a second. But Benoit Coré, there's been so much talk about whether we're entering a phase of currency wars. How, if we are, how much does that complicate the work of central banks? Well, <clears throat> well good morning. Um, <laughs> No, really, I think the last thing the world needs to, uh, today is a, is a currency war. That is really the last thing the global economy needs today. Uh, we live in a world of uh, floating exchange rates. Uh, we live in a world where exchange rates uh, are not and should not be targeted for, for competitive purposes. That's what the G20 and G7 have agreed. And uh, let's just uh, stick to that. Uh, and we've seen lots of volatility being created recently by different statements. I think that's not helpful. Um, any uh, discussion on the exchange rate should be sent back to uh, where it belongs, which is multilateral bodies, which is G7 and G20, and that's where that discussion should take place. Um, and uh, meanwhile, uh, volatility is not helpful, and if that would uh, reach a point where this would create a, uh, any uh, unwarranted consequence for, for us, any unwarranted tightening of our monetary policy, uh, we would have to, uh, to reassess. Uh, Axel, the, the U.S. Treasury Secretary shows up and says, actually, a U.S. dollar weaker is better for trade. Then his boss says, well, but we're targeting maybe a higher dollar. Is that currency wars? No, it's not. But, uh, you know, I think the U.S. position has always been very outspoken uh, to uh, focus on the strong dollar being in the interest of the U.S. Uh, if there is some deviation of that, markets are looking at that as well. Should we test that new proposition? So I think in the end, the U.S. will come back to the proposition that the strong dollar is in the U.S. interest. I think a strong currency is in the interest of many countries. Uh, but what monetary policy around the globe has been doing recently is actually, as part of quantitative easing, uh, currencies that were particularly easing were actually also easing on the foreign exchange side. And one of the transmission mechanisms of quantitative easing is through financial markets. And if quantitative easing is done between two currencies, it can also affect exchange rates. So uh, where we did see in the past some impact of QE was on exchange rates. I think now, as we're normalizing monetary policy, interest rate channels and credit channels are coming back more. And that, in my view, will mean that it doesn't mean that the exchange rate impacts will go and go away. Because central banks around the globe are getting out of QE at a different pace and also, you know, at a di in different stages. So I think, you know, the usual perception you would have with the U.S. exiting QE first, that that would actually have been something that would have driven the dollar continuously up. But we've seen periods where the dollar actually did the opposite and relative to the euro came down. So we are in a pretty uncharted territory. Exiting from QE will be a difficult exercise. But I don't think the dominant news this year will come from central banks. So, uh, you know, whilst I do think that the central banks will have to take a cautious approach and they're all doing that, I don't think the disturbance in financial markets are largely going to come from central banking because it's pretty much on track uh, to what they announced. It's more the geopolitical and other risks you mentioned that I think have the potential to disturb the global economy. Zoom in. But I agree with exercise. Those comments not necessarily, you know, represents a, the tracy, a currency war, but it's confusing, right? And the market has been very volatile, I mean, because this is a major currency, I mean, when the two key peoples, you know, have a very different views on the currencies, and the market obviously listened carefully, and very confused, the market got, got nowhere. I think that's very important. And particularly in current situations, so when monetary uh, policies start to turn, and the, the key central banks are still in a different phase of monetary policy, US leader first, ECB still follow as second, and Japan still. In that time, I think uh, the, the exchange rates can be very volatile. So, uh, and, uh, we, although 
I, I, I agree with you. I don't think it's currency war, but uh, uh, the authorities have got to be very careful, uh, keep the, the, the currency war in their mind. We, tr we should try our best to avoid that. Ray? I think it's <clears throat> important to look at the mechanics of who determines where cur the currency movements are. A policymaker like the Treasury Secretary making a statement can affect the mood a bit. Central bankers can affect relative monetary policies, and so they can affect it. And then there are those who hold portfolios. They can hold reserves in currencies, uh, they, um, and they have a big effect. And <clears throat> um, the portfolio is very skewed toward dollars and dollar assets, the world asset portfolio, um, even more than the currency mix. So the holding of dollar bonds whoever is going to hold those dollar bonds, that's a pile of dollars for a long-term pile of dollars. And how you feel about those dollars bonds will affect it. I do believe that currency will be a big issue this year, as there's a reconsideration of how important the dollar is as a re world's reserve currency. Is it an anachronism? Are portfolios too skewed in that direction? I think they're skewed in a that too skewed in the dollar direction because if you wanted diversification, you wouldn't have so much. So I do think that central bankers will be paying more attention to currency as a consideration in setting monetary policy. Ordinarily, you know, it's growth and inflation, yeah. but growth, inflation, and currency. I think currency will be a factor in the next year. But right, they they won't be used, or will they be used as a as a trade tool? I think central bankers will react to it, not cause it. Deputy Governor? Um, coming from a small open economy, uh, we have to live with uh, what the big elephants are doing out in the world economy. Uh, and uh, I think it is uh, clear that with, with free capital movements and the interlinked financial institutions, uh, interest rate channel and, and the credit channel are, are more or less designed by international forces, which for a a small economy, and we have to be honest with the fact that the, ex the uh, exchange rate channel is a part of the transmission channel. Um, so when a number of central banks, including ourselves, has been struggling with low inflation for a long time, um, we have, as been said, uh, trying not to cause to big exchange rate movements, but we have to take it into account. Uh, now, as Exxon mentioned, uh, we're getting out of this very sort of extreme situation we've been fighting with for a number of years where interest rate and credit factors might become more domestic again. So if there was a, is a currency war, perhaps we're getting out of it rather than getting into it. No, at the end, it's very simple. I mean, what we want to see is, I mean, market exchange rates are driven by market forces, uh, as they should. So what we want to see is, is exchange rates reflecting different financial conditions in different places. And different financial conditions in different places reflect the, uh, the state of the business cycle. It's very simple, in fact. And that's what we've seen by and large. Uh, and and, and, and we, we have to keep it like that. But I just wanted to highlight something Ray said, which is very important, which is that the dollar remains uh, the uh, main uh, invoicing currency for the world, for trade, trade invoicing, services invoicing. So whatever happens to the dollar exchange rate remains very important, uh, which gives a particular uh, 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 important to that discussion and that what it, it has to be uh, structured and contained and the, again, the right place to have it is uh, G7 and G20. Currency, we currency weakness at this time, dollar weakness at this time, adds more stimulation to an already heavily stimulated environment with a limited amount of capacity. That means that from a central bank point of view, you're, there's stimulation on top of stimulation and that is going to produce a reaction. I mean, how do you, how are you as a Fed official then going to have to deal with a very delicate set, set of circumstances? I think, and I think that's a real thing. The point Ray mentioned is absolutely right. You have to look at the ultimate holders of portfolios uh, in currencies and how they adjust. I'll give you one example from Switzerland. When uh, we came out of the financial crisis and when Europe was going through difficulties, we've seen the Swiss franc appreciate quite a bit. And it didn't come from a sort of flight into quality of global investors. It came from a repatriation of Swiss citizens invested in global portfolios who suddenly recuperated some of that money and brought it home. And so 
the private sector in Switzerland created an inflow into Switzerland. It wasn't international investors, it was domestic citizens recalibrating portfolio allocations. And then the Swiss National Bank, in order to offset that, because the Swiss franc was rising pretty heavily at that point in time, started an intervention policy where basically they try and stabilize the Swiss franc by intervening and buying assets abroad. So the Swiss QE was not buying Swiss government bonds or equity, it was buying European government bonds and equities and creating a structural outflow of liquidity in order to counterbalance that. So you can see how the two forces that Ray mentioned will always be in interplay, the official sector and what they do, uh, and very often they react to a situation in the private markets rather than being actual drivers of these, uh, of these allocations. Jimin, could the dollar actually not be a reserve currency in five, ten years? My view is the dollar is increasing, actually, as a, as a reserve currency. But we, I, I had that discussion with Ray the other day because many of the banks who are now holding portfolios uh, will try and make sure that they are liquid in dollar portfolios if we were to face other liquidity issues. Uh, because one of the things you have to fear nowadays is Whatever was done in the last financial crisis when there were currency swap arrangements between the major central banks, that the ability of the central banking community to reignite the same instruments to the same degree <coughs> is probably more limited now after the financial crisis than it has been before. The central banks really need to be conscious of that. Mm -hmm. And if we come back to a new situation like that, we do to some degree or to a large degree rely on the central banks to step in and provide liquidity for global banks. But banks have a precautionary motive, so we're trying to make sure that in the core currencies, in particular in dollar, we have liquid long-dated portfolios. Two men? Yeah, I, uh, <clears throat> I don't think it's necessarily. The crisis is starting in the United States. Yes, it is true. Uh, the dollar enhances its position as a current, uh, reserve currency after crisis, that's very true. But after RMB joined SDR, we, we observed the diversification really happens globally. And even Bundesbank announced, you know, we'll take RMB into reserve currency in more and more countries. But in addition to <clears throat> the reserves, what will happen is a swap line. There's a huge amount of RMB swap lines in, across various countries. And uh, this is also <coughs> very important diversification. So I, I, I think, so I always say, the, in terms of reserve currencies, the world moving to the more diversified. Obviously, academically, they're always debating whether one figure is more stable or multiple is more stable. But I always say multiple is more stable. So at this particular moment, I mean, the confusing comments on dollar, not necessarily to en enhance or, or, or stabilize the dollar's position as a reserve currency. Benoit and then Ray. No, I'm standing on, on Min's side in, in that discussion. I think the, you have to make a difference between the, the role of, a, of the dollar as a funding currency, and it's uh, uh, extraordinarily important, as, uh, as Axel said, to, uh, to, uh, as, uh, as uh, oil in the, in the wheels of the system. Uh, and by the way, we still have the dollar swaps, and they can be used, uh, and they would be used if there would be any uh, liquidity event in the, in the global system, uh, which, which, which is not there today. Uh, but then if you move to the real side of the economy, uh, you see a lot of diversification. You see uh, trade invoicing uh, patterns changing. You see renminbi uh, gaining importance uh, in trade invoicing. Uh, renminbi gaining importance in uh, foreign exchange reserves. We ourselves at the ECB, <coughs> we've invested 500 billion euros in renminbi, which is small, but a, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a small token. Uh, it's a... Uh, it's a way for us to uh, learn about the market and, uh, and uh, I have no doubt that it will, uh, it will grow bigger over time. So you will see this, this diversification trend uh, in the long run. I think it's just notable that as we're having that discussion, mm -hmm. what are the pros and cons and what should it be set at? Where in the past it was always taken for granted. So that means change. Because <laughs> if you start to think about, or oh, what is the portfolio diversification, you come up with one big answer like, I don't want to have nearly as much dollars. If you're dealing with, oh, the swap lines, how much should I have for the swap lines? Then you might want to have more dollars. Just the fact that there is that is going to produce a lot of change in the role of the dollar as a reserve currency, I think. Um, Deputy Governor, talk to me about how your view has changed on what policy could look like at the Riks Bank. I know in the past you've always followed the ECB. Now you'd be ready to hike before them. So um, it's an open economy, and 50% of our export goes to the Eurozone. So we didn't have much uh, independence uh, to start off with, uh, but, but there is there. 
but it got limited uh, as we were seeing inflation deviating from the target and inflation expectations going south. So, um, as I said before, uh, we have to admit that the, ex the exchange rate channel is, is a vital channel. Uh, it, can't, it can't go too much to the wrong, uh, getting us too far away from, from the inflation. Otherwise, we, we lose the anchor. Um, we had six years of inflation uh, uh, below the target. It took three years to get down to zero, another three years to, to get it back. Now I would say that we have, we have accomplished uh, the mission we, we set out to do. Um, so there we, we have some more uh, maneuver, time to maneuver again, but it has not been very big in the first place. What's your biggest headache when you look at data points or when you look at, uh, I, I, we'll talk about the Phillips curve in a second, but what do you wish you could understand better about your economy? Well, it is actually a lot about the Phillips curve. Uh, we, we see quite a good expansion, not only in Swedish economy, but in many economies now. But it seems like the responsiveness between wage growth and uh, and the unemployment gap, the resource utilization, is not as, as clear as it was in the, in the past. Um, so cyclically, it looks fairly benign, but structurally, there are a lot of strong forces behind that, uh, in my view, points to uh, a low wage growth in, in many years to come in, in the world. But Nokari, how can you be, how can the ECB be so sure that actually inflation is coming in 2018? Okay, so let's talk about the Phillips curve. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but let's start. Maybe let's start from from the from the beginning. I mean, uh, uh, the uh, I guess the, the question lots of people are asking themselves is how can it be that we've injected so much money in the system and inflation is still weak? That's the starting point of the discussion. Though I mean, the Milton Milton Friedman said inflation is a, always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. We've created uh, huge amounts of money and uh, inflation remains low. So what what's happening? And, and here, I think you really have to think about the <clears throat> monetary policy transmission process as a, as a two-step process. First step is transmission from monetary policy uh, impulses to the economy, aggregate demand, slack in the economy. And the second step is from slack in the economy, unemployment, aggregate demand to inflation, really two steps. And the first step has been, has been working incredibly well, incredibly well. I mean, QE has been a resounding success both in the US uh, and, uh, and in Sweden and in the Eurozone, everywhere in terms of its impact on, uh, on the economy. Uh, in the Eurozone, uh, we've seen, uh, I guess, 18 quarters of consecutive growth now. This has been, this is being the uh, strongest and broadest uh, recovery for the last 20 years. Um, it has exceeded our expectations. Um, it's a very strong impact that we've seen. And it's, it's largely due to QE, including, by the way, the exchange rate channel of transmission of QE that we've discussed already, uh, which is part of it, uh, and which, will, uh, which remains part of it. So uh, that has been incredibly, incredibly useful. Now the question is when, when and how does it translate into a higher inflation? And that's where the, the Phillips curve uh, fits in. And the way we, th we think of the Phillips curve in the Eurozone is really as being very flat for high levels of unemployment uh, because workers have no bargaining power. They're not in a position to ask for higher uh, wages. They just want a job. Uh, and they first have a part-time job uh, or they first have a, uh, a, uh, 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 an interim job. Uh, and then they move into permanent job. And then only they ask for higher wages. So there is a, a sequence here. And uh, we, we are now at the point where we are start starting to see uh, wages uh, ticking up in, in a very uh, tentative way. Uh, also core inflation ticking up in a very limited way in the Eurozone, because we might be exactly at this uh, uh, tipping point where uh, the uh, Phillips curve is, uh, is deepening. The, 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 the difference we have with other jurisdictions is we have this diversity within the Eurozone, and it's happening differently in, at different paces across countries. So if you look at, say, Germany, the Netherlands, even Spain now, uh, you see, um, you see uh, underemployment, that is forced underemployment, going down because uh, they are moving closer to full employment or, or they are already at full employment in Germany, obviously. While, say, in France and Italy, uh, un unemployment is still higher. Uh, they are still further away from full employment and uh, you don't see underemployment going down. So it happens at different paces across the region. But we're moving to the point where we'll see, we'll see wages going up. But so what's, is there a danger that actually inflation picks up too quickly and all of a sudden? 
It's, I mean, I'm a central banker, so I'm, I'm paid to see it as a danger. Uh, and I, so, I, so yes, uh, it is a risk. It is, honestly, it is still a risk given the amount of slack in the economy, the amount of pent up uh, also debt, private debt, public debt, which has to go down, but is still way, waiting very much on, uh, on aggregate demand. So I would, I would see it as a, as, a, as a tail risk. That's a risk that global financial markets should consider. Maybe we have time to come back to that, sure. the risk of a higher inflation. But uh, in the, as far as the eurozone is concerned, I would see it as a tail risk. Axel Weber? I would be a bit more cautious about the resounding success of some of the quantitative policy we've seen. Mm -hmm. uh, it reminds me a bit of uh, you know, success of many fathers, uh, failure as an orphan. Uh, people looking at the current recovery, it's a multidimensional recovery and many things play a role. If you look at the US first and foremost, uh, fiscal stimulus is one big element why this is driven forward. So, on, on the QE side and on the Phillips curve. I always remind people it's a curve, it's not the Phillips line. Uh, and at some point that inflection point comes and I think Benoit was a bit too much, it's a line and we can be oh. sure about that. Uh, you, okay. you mentioned that at some point it'll step up, but I would be less sure that central banks have a very good understanding of where that inflection point will, will set in and I, I think monetary policy clearly is gonna have, face some difficult challenges. First. QE works largely by, if you go to zero or negative interest rates, the credit channel and the interest rate channel are largely shut off. And monetary policy largely then works through financial markets and through exchange rate channels. Now, on the financial market channel, we've seen a massive improvement in market valuations and in market uh, moving away. As central banks go back to normalizing interest rate, they're switching back on the credit channel and the interest rate channel, and I wouldn't be as sure that that switch back to a more broad-based effect of transmission of monetary policies throughout the economy, including through the banking system, will happen as smoothly as the central banks now hope. So I think uh, we're into difficult uh, territory here, and I think it's been an, uh, an experiment that was unprecedented. Coming out of that, we don't really have good guidance on how this will work. So being data dependent is very important, I admit that, but at the same time, central banks need to very clearly watch that inflation could be the big surprise, in my view, this, this year, and I haven't really heard that in the debates here. Do you want to respond and then we go to Tumin? Well, I don't, um, I, I, I wouldn't disagree with, with Axel that the, um, I mean, the different channels of monetary policy transmission are now, are now being switched on, switched back. The credit channel is working, it's up and running. Um, it was not working. <clears throat> back in 2012. So a lot of our effort at the ECB has been about uh, switching on the credit channel through the LTROs and also, by the way, through the banking union. And, uh, and actually and, regulation helped. And what know. I hope is, uh, is, uh, is tougher supervision across the Eurozone and, uh, and, uh, and tougher stress tests and the like. And that has helped a lot. And everything that we're doing as supervisors on NPLs, non-performing loans, is also something that, uh, that helps uh, switch on the credit channel in the Eurozone. It's very important. Um, and we need to be very cautious, I agree with that. But we'll be entirely data-driven. So uh, there are many ways, I mean, we know the direction. Uh, there are different ways to get there, uh, and it's a discussion which is data-driven. If anything bad happens or surprising happens on the inflation front, it's fairly easy for us to react. So it may happen, uh, but then we have all instruments. Uh, but meanwhile, uh, we also have to be very prudent uh, not to uh, uh, derail the recoveries that we're seeing now. Yeah, I, I don't see the risk uh, inflation will pick up strongly and uh, quickly, I don't see that. I mean, from classical ways, you will see the commodity price is still relatively stable and in the low bonds, all right? And the US overcapacity is still existing in many, many countries and the labor market still have the space mm -hmm. and uh, even the monetary policy start to turn. So all those things tell you inflation may not be able to jump up. But that's not the issue. The issue is, I always ask myself, do we really understand what does inflation mean today? With the technology, with the e-commerce, with the artificial intelligence, efficiency increased dramatically, the transactional costs dropped dramatically, the competition through the e-commerce platform dropped the price quickly, quickly to the lowest whatever the level, or you can call the market equilibrium. Does 2% inflation rate today mean the same thing 2% 15, 20 years ago? I don't think so. Should we still keep inflation target 2%? I don't think so. 
So in that case, I think that's a fundamental issue. We have to think about what market structure changed. What does inflation mean for us today? So the central bank have to be very careful because we all live our central bank before, live on the inflation target uh, monetary policy framework. We have to think carefully what does inflation mean <coughs> today and what will be the proper monetary policy. Let me go to the deputy governor and then Ray Daly. What does inflation mean? Uh, and I'd like to pick up on this because it's, uh, I mean, it's our job as central bankers to understand how the economy evolves and, and how the inflation drivers change. And I, I agree with that, that um, there are a number of technological um, sort of benign shocks. They're good for, for, for us as human beings. It's fantastic to be a consumer in this, uh, this economy, but it's also fun to be a producing side and being a part of the labor market. So um, I, I, I think the reason for why we see quite low wage uh, uh, growth globally, or at least in the advanced economies, is we have still the legacy from the global financial crisis. A lot of people got very hurt there. So you. You prioritize uh, job security above uh, higher salaries as, a, as the first order uh, reaction. And then um, you, you perhaps get, get a more, more ambitious as, as the um, recovery becomes more mature. Um, when it comes to the te technological changes, the, um, the e-commerce and, and greater transparency, uh, I, don't be I don't believe that uh, that means that inflation is is, is a thing of the past, it's gone. We as human beings are uti utility maximizing creatures, you know, it has taken us from the, the, the caves to where we are today. So and in economic terms, it means once when we have sort of gone through all these disruptions that technology uh, and trade uh, uh, gives us to handle, um, as an as a, as a employee, you will ask for a higher salary when you have the opportunity to do it. And as a company, you will try to raise your prices to, to increase your earnings. And that are the forces for inflation long term. And in that environment, I think the best contribution you can do as a central banker is to have a price stability target. Because in a world where everything floats and everything uncertain, at least if people can, can uh, expect that, OK, price stability is somewhere there, then you don't have to worry too much about that factor on top of every, all the other factors that there is to, to worry about. Um, Ray Dalio, two questions for you. Are we focused too much on inflation? Do we care if it's at 1.7 or 2.3%? And what is the right policy mix for the world we live in today? Yeah. So uh, four, four things that have to be balanced, I think. First, the Phillips curve. Let's agree that any notions of how the Phillips curve is working, forget them. So let's not be guided by the usual association of linkages between inflation and growth. So it's dead. It's not even broken. It, it's, it, I, I believe that we could, technology and the nature of that is changing completely the relationship between inflation and growth. And if you look at the breakdown of wages and, and it's followed, it's had a cyclical pattern, but it's followed in a slower than normal ma manner. And if you look at the other components of inflation, goods inflation, there's goods chronic goods deflation. So the emphasis of the cycle is exaggerated relative to um, what everybody believes is the Phillips curve. Otherwise, it's demonstrated, right? So if everybody's just so focused on growth and that linkage to inflation, but yet look, <clears throat> Uh, after all this quantitative easing and all of this struggling, they're still struggling to get a core inflation rate in the United States, Europe, and Japan of 2%. They're still struggling to do that, right? So the headline should be, we don't understand that at a minimum, central bankers should say, we cannot rely on that. So we have to see some core inflation in order to react to that. Because number, number two, and then let's take inflation. How big of a worry is inflation? relative to the worry of a downturn. In other words, when central banks are managing these things, they have to weigh one against another. So I'm dealing with the asymmetry of that risk. Supposing, supposing we're wrong, and they're too easy, and you got to 2.5% inflation, is that going to be a tragedy? Is that what we're going to be talking about? Or, would, or supposing they erred on the other side, and we had a downturn. Now, can you imagine a downturn now? And then let me deal with the sensitivity of the mar of, of, to rate changes. There is a greater sensitivity to monetary policy changes than there has ever been before. 
That's because the market sensitivity, if you look at the pricing of markets, the duration of assets has become very long, long which means that the price sensitivity of bonds and all other assets to an interest rate change is greater than before. There's so much more also le leveraging up in certain ways. The market sensitivity to a rate change is very high. So if the central banks discount more, raise interest rates that is more than discounted in the curve, that will be priced through all asset classes, not only bonds, but it'll be priced through other asset classes, and that'll hurt other asset classes. If you start to hurt other asset classes, that's the first stage. Let's remember where we are in the cycle. We are late in the cycle, relatively late in terms of operating rates and so on, and we're having a stimulation into that. So the, the question is, I think, on central bankers, is how calm will you be during that? Or will you get it right? And central bankers never get it right because it's not a perfect balance. That's why we have recessions. We always have that. So if you're going to take the asymmetric risk, which side of that asymmetric risk do you want to be on? I would want to be on the, oh, OK, so let's see 2.5%. <clears throat> if you got a, a, you know, then that wouldn't be a problem. I don't want <laughs> particularly the polarity in the, country, in the world no. between the rich and the poor. There is a total difference in the economies when we look at the averages. So I wouldn't want a downturn. Okay, I feel, I feel like uh, Ben Makare has earned his right of reply. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I guess I can, uh, I guess, I guess, well, first, I guess Cecilia and I can confirm that we're, we're, very, we're very, very calm. <laughs> we'll keep, we'll keep, we'll keep very, being very calm <laughs> and, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll strike the right balance. Uh, and it, it is a balancing act, uh, as, as Ray said. Um, and, uh, and we have to, 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 uh, to, to find the right balance. But I, I, would, I would frame the discussion slightly differently, starting from where Ray left it, which is about the asymmetry of risks. And over the last five to 10 years, we've been focusing very much or even only on uh, downside risks, tail risks, tail risks to the downside. Uh, first, deflation risk, which is now by and large off the table, but it has been a huge effort to take that risk out of, the, out of the discussion, out of the radar screen in Europe. And it needed a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, it, it needed very forceful action. Um, and now uh, risks of a uh, sluggish growth, uh, risk of uh, 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 prices and remaining low, et cetera. Um, and we're also slowly moving out of that. And so we'll have, looking, looking forward, we'll have to, uh, to focus more on upside risks. And that's where I would agree with Axel. Uh, I would even agree that at a global level, there is some uh, complacency of global financial markets when, when it comes to upside risk and inflation. So I'm talking globally, not specifically of the Eurozone. Uh, if you look at the, uh, at the flatness of yield curves, uh, if you look at the at risk premia, I mean, risk premia remains very low, even negative uh, in the US. So that's evidence of some complacency with regards to upward uh, uh, risks to, uh, to nominal variables, to, pr to prices. Uh, um, and, uh, and when global markets wake up to that risk, at some point, uh, curves may, may, may steepen, uh, risk premium will be reduced, uh, and it's, a, it's something that will happen. Uh, but uh, what I would, in terms of central bank reactions, uh, I think what matters a lot is that the instruments are different. Uh, we'll be moving, as we move away from coping with downside risk to coping with upside risk, we're moving away from unconventional policies to conventional policies. Um, and instru all instruments are there. So it has been very difficult to, to, find, to design instruments, to find the instruments to fight deflationary risk. Uh, the instruments came with lots of potential uh, collateral effects, side effects that we didn't know because that was entirely new. Uh, political reactions were uh, sometimes uh, unpredictable or sometimes all too predictable. Um, and, uh, and that created noise around our action. Um, and we, 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 we've, we've lived in that very difficult environment. When we move back to gradually to normal monetary policy, all instruments are there. So it's not a big deal. It's, 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 it's a no-brainer for us to, to deal with higher inflation because all, infl all, all, all instruments are there. So I'm, I'm not that much worried. I don't think that there's clarity in maybe what I'm saying or the understanding. I don't know that we're communicating clearly, so perhaps I can clarify. Mm. Um, we're in agreement that there is now upside risks because we're at a limited amount of capacity and a lot of stimulation. 
and then w that there needs to be some kind of tightening. But then there's a balance, and you want to try to get it perfectly. So now let me ask you the question. If you were going to make a mistake so that you had a half a point higher than inflation or an economic downturn when trying to get that right, um, which would you think would be the worst outcome? Well, that's not the way we look at things because we, we, don't, we don't have a dual mandate. We okay. have a single mandate, which is inflation. Uh, 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 so uh, that's about inflation uh, being no, okay, 2% but I, to the medium term. Okay, so let's take the, let's take the <laughs> question then on the inflation, on the core inflation rate. Mm. You've been struggling to get the core inflation rate to 2% for a very, very long time. You're <clears> going <throat> to now have a cyclical boost mm -hmm. here, right? Yeah. How much attention do you think you should pay to the actual inflation rate relative to the cyclical boost and the stimulation? I would think not too much, right? Yeah. No, as I said, uh, we, uh, we want to be uh, patient and, and, uh, and prudent along that road. Uh, <coughs> okay. I'm in me, favor of patience and prudence. Let, let's get let to... Let me jump in. I, I think uh, <laughs> now uh, I'm a professor, so... I'm so you can person, say what you want. I'm the person to stand between the central <laughs> bank... Uh, and the, and the market markets. Uh, practitioners. <laughs> I would say the central bank is doing quite, 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 they did quite a good job in the past. In a sense, they're very cautious, carefully raise interest rates and match with the market expectations. The indicator is, if you're looking for, in, in the Fed case, if you're looking for the Fed adult line, and the market expected the Fed, uh, uh, the, 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 the funding rates, right? Actually, the, the market expected rates actually close, converged to the Fed adult line the gap, the term premium, actually is shrinking. So I think that's good. Many, you, you, you may disagree, but the line goes that way. I think it's good. But the real issue is whether, if we're looking for the futures, the Fed will continue to, I mean, including ECB and all the central bank, the monetary policy, uh, do a good communication work with the market and continue to these two lines converging to each other to avoid the market volatility. Let me sure. get in, Axel. Ryan, we'll come back to you. Axel, do, do you worry more about uh, too quick an interest rate rise or too slow? What I look at is what is the guidance central banks give and what is priced into the market. And you've seen an example for it now in, in the U.S., where, for example, most of the market expected up to two rate moves this year, and a bit more next year, the Fed has given guidance of three rate moves. The market is currently repricing. The market is repricing by putting in three possibly four rate increases this year, and you have to ask yourself, why does that happen? And it happens because the Fed said, we will be data dependent, and the market is reading the data that are coming in as of the tax reform and everything, and says, in the next meetings, the Fed will see a much more bullish set of data and therefore will start to revise their outlook, and that's why the market is repricing. And a repricing of the market is how central bank communication then gets translated into markets and how its impact on the economy. Where I do have a concern as we're coming out of this QE is how useful, and I don't think it is any more useful, is forward guidance by central banks. For example, you know, just to look at the particular predicament of the ECB, and we have the benefit of Wenwa being here, tying your hand on purchases for some time and also indicating that there will be a long delay till you then move interest rates probably has stopped being as useful as it was in the past, where a commitment device like that kept everyone expecting loose monetary conditions will prevail. As we're coming to be more data dependent, that will be phased out, just like it was in the US. And I think the market pricing and how it reprices policy as data come in is, gonna, is the way I look at that. And so where we are now, I think central banks are on the cautious side and probably how the market is repricing, that was the right side to be. As we're moving into a stronger economy, as fiscal stimulus comes in, as the US might add some infrastructure investments, there's other non-monetary policy stimulus that will make monetary policy stimulus <coughs> less required to go forward and could actually turn monetary policy stimulus, if not changed, into a counterproductive overstimulation that then would ignite, help ignite inflation. So that's, I think, where, where I, how I would put it. But actually, is so, forward guidance not good also for households and for animal spirits of a region or a country? Well, look, as financial markets are the core transmission at the moment still of monetary policy, as many of that happens through valuations in asset market, as Ray says, a too fast or faster than expected monetary tightening will hurt 
financial markets beyond what would be required in a pretty predictable normalization. I think that's the concern. I think we all can repricing. agree on something, and it's an important thing to agree on, so I think we're here. I think that what we had as far as uh, guidance <clears throat> in monetary policy by the Federal Reserve for something like two years was wrong, and the markets discounting that was wrong. And there needed to be less rises in interest rates than were discounted in the markets and that the Fed said, and that was good. And, the, and we had a bull market as a result of that. We are now in a spot where the markets are discounting very little increase and the Fed is saying a little bit more. And now the question is, do rates rise faster than is discounted and they're told because the set of circumstances happened? And I think we can all agree that that would then be bearish on the markets. <coughs> is that right? Can we all agree on that? Yeah, okay. wait. Uh, well, uh, uh, this is a particular point. Let me add one thing quickly. Communication becomes the key issue. I think the mar exactly yeah. the Fed didn't say very much. Market did not discount very much. But in this particular moments, the potential risk, we have a new Fed chair. I'm not questioning the, the, the chairs. I mean, Jeremy Powell is a very experienced central banker. But also, he has almost a new team. So how is the Fed communicated to the market and, and lead the market discounting the Fed, uh, the, the, the margin policy garden? Uh, let me just get important. Benoit's thoughts on this. Benoit Curry, I mean, should you care real. about the markets so, no, as on, a central bank? On the Fed, I'm not commenting at all. <laughs> <laughs> I have full, uh, full uh, trust in, uh, in Jay Powell to, 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 steer, <laughs> to steer that. Uh, uh, in, a, uh, in, a, uh, in a prudent and, and sensible way. Um, forward guidance is, a, is, is an important discussion. Um, and let me start by saying that it has served us very, very well uh, so far. It has really helped a lot together with low rates, negative rates, and all the, the rest of the, of the toolbox. It has been uh, instrumental in, uh, in making sure that financial conditions in the Eurozone would remain fit to our economic conditions, which is, in a sense, the thrust of everything we're doing. We want to be sure that financial conditions uh, in the Eurozone remain appropriate for the state of the economy, which is not the same as in other places, like in the US. And forward guidance has been part of that and very uh, important in uh, stabilizing and anchoring and pinning down the, the short end of the, of the yield curve. Now, uh, it will have to evolve. Uh, this is acknowledged. Uh, the, uh, we are in a transition. We'll see a gradual uh, uh, evolution, gradual transition of our instruments. Uh, we've started that. Uh, we've insisted, for instance, quite a lot on the fact that our monetary policy stance is not only about QE, it's about QE, but it's also about the uh, acquired stock of assets, which, uh, has in our, which is now very substantial and has an, an impact on market condition, a substantial impact, I would say. Uh, it's about uh, the rate guidance. Um, and so, um, we, uh, we have a mix of instruments, and uh, the, um, it's agreed that, that it's something that we have to discuss. Uh, we said it in the, uh, in the account of the, uh, of the December discussion. And by the way, there has been a lot of comments, noise around uh, governing council members disagreeing around that. Uh, the discussion we're having so far is on when to have a discussion on how we change the guidance, right? So it's... Uh, it's, it's meta-monetary policy, if you want to call it like that. <laughs> so just to put a little bit of, you know, to take a little bit of distance with that. Uh, so it's not, it's not a... Uh, it's not a uh, so the discussion is not on March It's not an existential as difference, as, uh, as Mario said yesterday. Okay. Um, Deputy Governor, what's your take on forward guidance? Is this an effective tool for monetary policy? Um, well, it, it's, uh, it's really for the people in the transmission mechanism, EA, the financial markets, to, to, to answer. But, but for me, it, it is... Um, we have our version of for, forward guidance is... Um, uh, an interest uh, rate path, the policy rate path that has, we, we publish uh, at e each policy meeting since um, 2007. And it, it definitely clarifies the discussion both we have on the board uh, on what is not re only required in the present decision taking, but also going forward. And I think it also clarifies the discussion with versus the market players on what is the most um, uh, sort of the optimum monetary policy going forward. So I think it's it's, it's there to stay, uh, at least in our case, with the interest rate path. Uh, can I also go back a little bit? I, I thought your, your question is, is a bit sort of uh, mean to say, do, do you choose between going on plus 0.5 percentage points, higher inflation, or avoiding a downturn, cyclical downturn? 
it's important to remember that there are always cyclical reasons for not taking difficult decisions. Um, but if you are in the, in the chair of, of having to take decisions, um, you have to try to look uh, a bit longer. Uh, and we don't frame the, the decision making, as, as Benoit said, in, 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 that, in that way that you, you put it. But it's, it's about asking yourself, OK, we may overshoot the inflation potentially. Uh, but if that is a temporary thing, we should allow for that to happen. If it is a permanent thing, we have to be a lot more cautious because one of the things we learned in Sweden as inflation deteriorated below the target is that it takes a lot longer now mm -hmm. to bring it back to target. You have to fight with the economic agents in society a lot more about bringing back the trust. Mm -hmm. So if anything, you have to keep your eye on the core objective price stability much tighter now than, and, than, than in the past. Who on the panel is expecting a downturn in the next 18 months? No, no. no. So I, actually, I, possibly. I would say, I, I would say um, there's a question of a bear market mm -hmm. within the next 18 months. And then there's a, and if you have a bear market, you, you can have a bear market in bonds, a, a big bear market in bonds. You can have a big increase in rates, sensitivity. You can have a big reaction as that. And I would say then that there would be a reasonable likelihood of something like 12 months after that to have a downturn. I would say it would be a reasonably high probability that you would have a downturn in the next two years, three years, which would also be just before the next presidential election. And I think that there would be polarity, a lot of polarity. So I would say a lot. If you were to ask the panelists, uh, I'm just speaking frankly, you know, what is the probability of a downturn within the next two or three years? That's an interesting question. And then what would that downturn look like? How would that look like? What would it look like? In the next two to three years, the probability can be very high. Very high, 50% or, or more? More than that. More than that. Well, I, I guess uh, if you look at the horizon like that, that's actually beyond the usual policy horizon of central banks if you look at two to three years out. So uh, if you look at your models, they would usually tell you you're going back to some kind of normal because that's how these models are constructed. But I do think, as Ray said before, we are in a late cycle stage. And this cycle has been artificially prolonged partly by monetary policy, but recently by stimulated fiscal policy. Look at the US. We rarely had such a fiscal stimulation which will lift growth for one or two years by 0.5 to 0.75 at such a late part of the cycle. <clears throat> you add in the announcement of the uh, administration to look into infrastructure investment and private-public partnerships, again, adding more dynamics to the economy. And that's where I think monetary policy comes into the game because people are expecting that as monetary policy is starting to move rates up and up, the only effect we've seen so far, and that is counterproductive, is the long end stayed largely put, and monetary policy at the short end has actually flattened the yield curve. That's not your usual environment. And so the real question is, how is the long end of the market? How is the market repricing that? If the market reprices suddenly, the central banks will have a problem. If the market takes it at a steady pace, central banks can continue to take their time and focus on it. But that's an open question, as Ray said. Mm -hmm. It depends on how convincing communication by central bank goes in the market. And actually, I'm sorry, uh, Benoit, I think forward guidance is the announcement of an, attention, of an intention. It's not a commitment device. And I think the market makes a very clear distinction about this. And the longer you pretend to tie your hands, but you actually don't, the market will reprice. So I think central banks have a balancing act to walk here. Benoit Carré? Um, well, forward guidance is a uh, declaration of intentions. It's clarification of our reaction function. And then it is, it is being fed by a flow of data. So I have no, no, absolutely no disagreement with Excel on that. It's not a commitment. Uh, it's not, and it's not possible anyway. Uh, it's just clarification on how we expect to react given our reaction function on to which we commit, because that's a reaction function, that's our policy, and uh, the expected uh, flow of data, uh, uh, the expected course of the economy. It's called uh, forward it guidance, change. it's not called a forward promise, exactly. just to it's <laughs> forward, <laughs> it's forward. It doesn't exactly. solve the track. It's yeah. forward guidance. Axel? It doesn't solve the Let problem. Let Benoit finish. I think that's going to be important for the next two years. 
I think it's much less the actual the actions of the central bank that will determine how markets will react to it, but it's the reaction of markets themselves and how they look at the availability of liquidity and how they need to reprice an entire set of asset classes where risk has not been adequately priced over a number of years. And I think that repricing of risk will be a much bigger driver of the impact of monetary policy normalization on market and on the economy than actually the policy action itself. Benoit? Well, there is a lot going on in markets. There is a lot being decided in markets. There is a lot being decided in politics. <laughs> uh, but our contribution is to be as clear as possible on how we, we, we would react to that. And that's what forward guidance is about. But I just wanted to, more, more to, to comment on the, uh, on the forward, uh, on, the, on, the, on the perspectives. Um, and it's true that the, uh, over the, the next months, uh, maybe years, the uh, global prospects look very, very favorable. Uh, Eurozone is doing very well. US will be uh, uh, having a big stimulus. Uh, emerging market economies are full of, full of question marks. We're not discussing it here, but uh, by and large, uh, so far, it's OK. And so you see the global economy uh, running uh, uh, with, uh, with, with all engines uh, being fired. And the IMF, is, as we've seen, is. Uh, revising up their, their forecast. That's a, uh, so that looks very good, but that's also when you can make mistakes. Uh, when you're running the uh, uh, full speed along the highway, you've got to be very careful the way you drive now. So um, that will require a lot of co cooperation, coordination uh, internationally, uh, which leads me to an important point, which in a sense ties back to the discussion on, on foreign exchange that we had earlier. That, that is exactly the kind of environment where you need very strong international cooperation uh, a very, uh, 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 you need a lot of trust among the main players uh, and you need a, uh, the right framework to address all these issues. International cooperation is key if you want to avoid accidents. Yeah, regardless of what we say, actually say is a market repricing, as being one says, you know, political factor or uh, central bank policies, the real issues we have to face is how do we end this long cycle? Right, that's the whole thing. Can we have a softer landing? I think that's the real issue, right? This issue will bother us in the next 24 months. No, but by the way, I, I mean, I'm, I'm very happy to, to be having that discussion, but why don't, you, why, why, why don't you have the same discussion with finance ministers? Because that's about... <laughs> we do. It's another session. Yeah, okay, <laughs> so I'll be, I mean, I'll be interested, okay. in, uh, I'll be interested in, uh, in, uh, in knowing the answers. Excellent. But to go back to Ray's scenario of a likely downturn over the next two to three years, the real question that markets are, pricing, are, are asking themselves at the moment, so assume that were to happen, central banks will be back to the table to use monetary policy tools in order to mitigate the impact Do they of have that the space? And That's exactly the question the market is asking. Have they gotten by now to a position where they have the ability to use some of these tools or will we fall back then into the usual reaction that we've seen last time around, another round of unorthodox monetary policy to react it. And so that's an important one that will determine how markets will reprice this. But that so, was exactly my point. That was exactly my point, that uh, monetary policy has limited space uh, as we speak. And so you need to see fiscal space. You need to see a structural space, if you want to call it like that. Uh, and uh, that's why for, in the Eurozone, we've been urging finance ministers to rebuild fiscal buffers. You've got a better mix in the US. Hmm? Right. So, so we agree then that there's the question of whether we'll have adequate space, yeah. and then there's also the social political consequences of an economic downturn. So we would have to assume that we'll have, that won't be a pretty picture. We're gonna be, and, and, that, and so now I'll ask the question again. Is there asymmetry relative to something like if you were gonna be a little wrong, which side would you wanna be wrong on? Okay, we have two minutes, so I, I need one, maybe one... I, I, I'm afraid that where the discussion is going into that monetary policy should solve all the problems in the world here. Uh, we we won't be able to, to, uh, to, uh, to handle the social cohesion problems that we see in the world. I think, I think each and every policy area has to do what it's best at. We are not the only game in town, Benoit and I are the central bank community. The, it's the joint economic policy of the world that, that makes but, us this place a better place. Right. I'm not saying that you should be driving that for social welfare. I'm just saying, do we agree on that kind of picture? If There is a number of risks, yes, that's true. We, Guys, that. we have 50 seconds left. Benoit, I want to ask you about Bitcoin, just for like a hard, a hard <laughs> out. <laughs> and then we'll have another session next year. Oh, for, is it on Bitcoin? B in Bitcoin in 50 seconds? Yeah. Uh, okay. 
Um, let's be, um, let's act on the risks, and that's about regulation, and it's primarily investor protection, but it also has to be uh, uh, money laundering, terrorism finance, and everything, and the international community is uh, kind of uh, shaping, uh, uh, gathering, and we'll, we're preparing an answer to that, and I would expect, for instance, a G20 discussion uh, in Buenos Aires in March to focus very much on, on these issues. What's the regulatory answer? How do you understand, how do you control the, the gateways between the, uh, the shadow currency uh, universe and the uh, regular financial system? That's being discussed and, and there will be answers. But don't lose sight of the opportunities. The, the flip side of that discussion, what Bitcoin tells us as central bankers, is, our, is that our payment systems are too expensive and they are too slow and we've got to act on that. We need better cross-border payments uh, uh, also. Uh, Thank you. Also, no, 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 no. The, we need better cross-border payments also because it's good for development, it's good for financial inclusion. So bet, Bitcoin can help us, it can pay us a service by forcing us to upgrade our systems. That's a positive lesson. Thank you all.